Today's couples love planning their weddings with Zola. That's why it's the fastest growing wedding platform. It's got everything couples need for their entire wedding planning journey, including finding their venue, their planner, and their vendors. And wedding pros love Zola, the sponsor of today's episode, just as much as couples do. And I'll tell you why later in this episode. Hey, everybody, it's Andy Kushner with The Wedding Biz, and today's episode is a particularly fun one because we are recording live during Lori Aaron's masterclass at the beautiful and stunning Brush Creek Ranch in Wyoming. And let's introduce our three special guests. Um, I'll begin with the person next to me, who is Sarah Winward. Sarah is a destination wedding florist who creates floral arrangements inspired by the texture and changing of seasons in nature. She believes that flowers should feel natural in the environment that they're going to be viewed in, and so it goes to great lengths to source the perfect flowers to complete a desired look. And the final product really is an extension of the surroundings and her interpretation of nature, as we've seen here at Brush Creek Ranch. Sarah primarily works with flowers for events, but also works on installations for private and commercial clients. And she also offers various workshops. And I interviewed Sarah for the first time about a month ago. Her episode is going to be releasing this Monday. Those of you listening on the podcast, it will have passed. You in the room, be sure to tune in this Monday. Sarah, you're going to be extremely famous after this. <laughs> yeah, don't let it go to your head. Thanks for having me. <laughs> sure. And next to Sarah is Lori Ahrens of Lori Ahrens Special Events. Um, she's been on the wedding biz several times um, and has been featured in numerous magazine publications and was listed in Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, and Martha Stewart Weddings as one of the top planners worldwide. Her clients include trendsetters like Sofia Coppola, Vanessa Getty and Christy Turlington, and prominent business moguls like Gary Friedman and Frank Caulfield and Eddie DeBartolo. Thank you, Lori, for doing this again. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, and providing this wonderful, envi- wonderful environment. Um, Susan Kidwell is general manager with Hensley Event Resources. For the last 30 years, she has continued to raise the bar when partnering with planners and designers to create unique ways of transforming space. Her focus has been servicing the Northern California event community and more recently is expanding to out-of-state events as well. She truly enjoys the creative process of hearing a design concept and then breaking it down into production elements for her team to fabricate in multiple mediums with tents, metal, fabric, and wood. Um, And Susan is going to be interviewed shortly in in about a month or so, and so she'll be appearing on The Wedding Biz in a couple of months, so also be sure to tune in. So, um, Lori, I want to start with you. Um, when you first consider how you're going to transform a venue, like w- what is your first step? At, at what point do you then bring in people like Sarah or Susan? Well, I like to tour the venue with the client and obviously want the client to love the venue and buy into the decision to have their event or wedding there. And then I love to find out why they love the venue and make sure that it, to me, makes sense and is similar to what I am feeling about the beauty of the venue. I love to look at the architecture, the seasonality of the wedding. I want the design and the transformation to feel very seamless and not um, forced. I often design where people think that whatever I've built for the event lives there all the time when it actually doesn't. And that's the greatest compliment to me. I love integrating and being very sensitive to the existing property and making it just way more beautiful than it was. Do you prefer to transform an existing venue or start from a raw space like like an empty field, like like we saw yesterday? I like both. I I would be lying if I didn't say I liked um, working in an empty field more because then you've got, you know, you bring in everything and it's just a complete creative uh, process. And um, But working in a confined thing, it gives me something to latch on to. I always try to look for something that inspires me, a color, a texture, a pattern, something in the garden, something that I feel is worth sort of building off of. And if the client feels that as well, then we set the design mood board in place and then we bring in the floral people and people like Susan to custom and build things that that I'm kind of dreaming about in my brain. How do you decide um, what aspects of a venue to, to preserve? I mean, it's very individual to the 
venue. I just did a wedding with Susan and um, Sarah's team out in an empty field with spectacular views of the Tetons in, in Jackson Hole. There's nothing there. It's literally a field, no power, no water. Um, there's a road going in for the trucks to arrive <laughs> and the buses, but um, there's nothing there. So, you know, the Tetons were inspiring. Sarah and I were lucky to be able to visit a year before. So we got to see the the beauty of the landscape, the fields that were going to be surrounding us. And, you know, Sarah was inspired by certain things. I was inspired by other things. And together we were like, yes, yes, yes. And we talked to the client and they fell in love with it. Sarah, what is your, like your overall approach um, when designing, you know, for a venue transformation? Is there a particular process that you tend to follow every time? How does that go for you? Um, you know, usually, as Lori mentioned, I'll be brought in kind of round two, I think, after, or like second site visit, we'll go together. So after they've kind of figured out the structure of the event and we know, you know, what what events we'll be doing where and kind of maybe if that's in a tent or in the building, then we go and we get to look a little bit deeper and be inspired by the space. And I think I work in the same way Lori does. You find one thing that you love um, and then build off of it. And it's just kind of a really organic process. And I think I do that both with, I think, large scale when we're working on overall event and then also with the actual flowers. You find like one flower, one color, and then build on that. Um, Transforming a space with florals is fun. I mean, when you're talking large scale, we can, you know, it's maybe with events, it's a ceiling treatment or bringing in trees or um, huge branchy arrangements, something that will instantly transform like the whole space. Um, I think also... With florals, sometimes it's, you know, I think maybe the florist is relied on sometimes to cover something if you can't bring in someone like Susan. (laughs) So sometimes you don't have, let's say, the budget to do a big build out um, and we need to like bring the ceiling down maybe with some greenery so you don't notice the ceiling panels above head. Um, I also think making some more simple elements that are really striking is a great way to bring your attention down and to the tables instead of looking around if there's something you don't want to look at. (laughs) Um, But I think like color and scale is the most fun way to work with flowers and change a space. In a perfect world with a planner um, like who has not worked with you yet, what part of the design process would you really like to be brought in? Like how early? Yeah, I think, you know, it's so different with each planner and with each client. And once you've worked with someone, you know, kind of how you how that process is for the two of you together. Um, Like with Lori, I love coming in in the beginning because we collaborate really well together. And honestly, I enjoy all phases of it. Some some planners have the full design mapped out and they tell me what colors and flowers and candle holders. And while sometimes there's a loss of freedom there. (laughs) I also just really enjoy focusing on the flowers, but I generally love to be brought in as soon as possible. Um, because you know, the bigger decisions made for the event, um, very much influence what I do. So, you know, where the dinner is held and if the colors in there work with the color that they might want for their welcome dinner and whatnot. Um, so I like being involved from the very beginning and just talking with the client also about what they like about the space and how they want their event to feel. Um, You know, the way it looks is one thing, but I think understanding from the very beginning how they imagine their event to feel for their guests and how they want that weekend to feel really is valuable in determining what we make for them. Yeah. And Susan, when a planner like Lori approaches you with a, let's say a real complex venue transformation, what are the priorities that you want to discuss? Hmm. Good question. I guess for me, it's like, what's the focal point for her? Because when I, when I look at the space, everything is math to me. Because like, how many people, how much space is that going to take to get my arms around what needs to be defined to create the space? And then in that space, I just listen to the vision that they have and then figure out and break it down to the nuts and bolts. So for me, I like to be brought in as soon as possible when they know the general direction and then it's math. Like how many people, tables of eight, tables of 10, if we don't know, I, I go kind of back up 
and do tables of eight because that gives me more space to play with. Because once I define that space, that kind of defines the budget and it's easier to go down than up. So that kind of is my process. Again, I'm, I'm kind of basic at this aspect of the industry. Do you talk to the clients at all or is it really strictly with planners? No, it's really the, I, my client is the planner. Yeah. Or the caterer or whoever brings me in. I really, very rarely, unless it's a homeowner, where they're just getting the tent from us directly, do I talk to the... Does that happen very often, that you're dealing directly with... Yeah, we do a lot in the, in the Bay Area where, you know, Mrs. Smith wants something for her backyard or her own wedding, and there's not a planner involved. That's very more the exception. And Lori, what are some of, um, of your techniques for concealing, you know, unsightly elements of, of the area, the venue or the field or whatever? Well, thankfully, I have Susan by my side, who is an out-of-the-box thinker and is a genius in this regard. So we just did a wedding at um, this new hotel in the Napa Valley called Stanley Ranch, and it has so many great things about it, and it has great bones, and the food there is amazing. And it's in Napa, so of course that's attractive. Um, But the ballroom where we were having the big reception, it had like three peaked kind of ceilings like this in a row. With a big vent in the middle of each of them as your backdrop. And all these weird leather, modern, like Mondrian, like panels all all over the walls. So it was very, very busy. um, And I really wanted the band in the backdrop. So I came up with a plan with Susan to clad and to bring the drape up. Another planner had done drape, but they drew it across, so the peaks were left bare. And I really wanted to go into the peaks and cover up that busy wall so I could neutralize it and create something more dramatic. So, Yeah, and I thought of it as the gable end of a tent. There were just three of them, and I draped the gable end of the tent, which was the ballroom. Yeah. And Sarah, you know, again, from meeting you and, and having you on the show, I know, you know, you're very passionate and you're so strong at being able to bring emotional impact. And I, and I noticed that here too. It's, you know, it's, it's very moving your work. Do you have any favorite ways from a, to create that emotional impact? Like, how do you think about that? How do you get there? Yeah. I think I'm, color is always very fun. I think our first night here, we had bright red tulips all down the table and it was just very bold and very simple. But I think that impact really just draws you in. Um, And that's a really fun way to do that, I think, that isn't too busy. So also, like, if you're in a space that sort of has a lot going on and we haven't been able to have, like, Lori and Susan neutralize it, (laughs) keeping the florals simple but bold with color is great. Um, One of my favorite events was um, a tabletop that I did just kind of in the sandy Sandy um, wash up on a mountain. I did just bright, like just bright yellow flowers all down the table. Um, and I loved it because it was, I mean, it was just like the flowers kind of like sucked you in, but also it didn't take away or compete with the environment. It, like they were both really striking and together it was fun. And I think scale, I kind of already mentioned it. I love, while they're a challenge, I do love making larger installations. So it's like a stage backdrop or a hanging install. I think it's really fun to play with weight and proportion Mm. and kind of create that like um I guess ethereal effect sometimes or something that feels um that gives people sort of like an out-of-body different experience you know something suspended up high I think that's fun what are some of the challenges that that you face um or one of the biggest ones in terms of transforming a space with floral design what's a real tough one like figure that uh timeline (laughs) oh yeah timeline or the elements you know lots of times we're in a tent in a field and it's 80 degrees and full sun and we will have five hours or something to do um, a lot of work. And because we're the last layer that comes in in an event, we usually have like the least amount of time. Um, And we're also very, it's a messy job, especially when we're doing something like that. So um, I would say time and the elements, you know, we have to choose ingredients that will last and survive and mechanics and sometimes it's great we'll have people like Susan or other fabricators build structures for us but that's also a very technical side of the job and I think I'm not generally a very technical person I like I like to just feel things and go with it but you have to plan ahead so and Susan what about you what what's what are some of the biggest challenges you have to face weather Hmm. (laughs) um I mean we we think a good weather plans bad weather plans and I always encourage everybody to think about bad weather plans because if you have it 
in place, then it's more easier to roll into it and implement it. And with weather, sometimes it changes even more drastic. So we'll talk about some of that in the emergency later, but, you know, really make that time um, ahead of time to think through everything. Um, because if you don't, it's, you don't want flooding, you don't want puddling, you don't want tents blowing down because they're not staked right. Um, if there's a big windstorm, so, uh, weather's my biggest. Yeah. Lori, what about from your perspective? I mean, you know, when you, when you first get involved and you check out a space, I mean, what are some of the biggest challenges that you're like, oh, geez. Well, logistics are really important and access. I think, um, if I'm out in a field, not only, Do I want to feel like the beauty around the field or whatever the guest experience will be in terms of, I guess, the overall visual? I also like to preserve the field where we are so that there aren't tire marks and tracking and I'm very strict (laughs) with (laughs) my vendors um, because, you know, now there are drone shots, so Susan's nightmare is like, and you have to make the top look pretty too because the drones are going to be flying over so the wires can't show and it has to look perfect from every angle. So just thinking about all of that, I think, is a puzzle and I like it, but it's definitely very important. And I try to encompass the entire experience and not just focus on one aspect. It's, it's a big picture. Mm-hmm. Are there any uh, any events where all three of you have, wor- have worked together on? Oh, yeah. We can were you, just in Jackson Hole. Can you tell a story? You know, a specific story? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we followed all the trucking rules. That meadow still looked pretty yeah, nice. Yeah, it's true. The meadow yeah. was good. Yeah. The drone yeah. shots, yeah, there were no tire marks. There were like deer beds, though. We, I noticed oh, yeah. that we were like, oh no, who smashed the grass? But then we realized it was from deer or moose or something that were naturally there. <laughs> so. <laughs> and like all, yeah, a lot of the, the tall grasses were like in these like random like <laughs> clumps. And it was just so funny. Yeah. They said, oh, the elk came in or something. So I don't know. Was there. It went well, smoothly. I mean, yeah. It went it smoothly. It was a good story. <laughs> like, yeah, well, it was, yeah. we had a client who just really appreciated like the raw nature of the site. And she loved, I mean, she just wanted to be in a field. And she, you know, I feel like she would have had like no tent and no floor if she had her choice, maybe. Right. <laughs> but I think, you know, Lori also knows what's comfortable and how an event, what an event needs to have to make it. Yeah. You know, appropriate for the guests. And all the, so. path, all the paths were the planks that we talked about in terms of getting guests from the ceremony, which was in the beautiful meadow. Um, but then they walked the path to cocktails, which had good focal points um, to the metal pavilion that Lori designed um, in the center of the cocktails. And then, then you turned in 90 degrees and walked straight into the beautiful entry that Sarah, you know, designed for the, for the florals and then inside. So it was all focal points from one to the next to the next, which is important, I think, in designing and laying out the, the event flow. And hiding the back of house. That was one of the things that after working in that particular location for a couple of other events in previous years, like you just don't want to see the back of house ever. And the way that we flowed this event, there was a good way to hide it and it was very satisfying because I do not want the guests <laughs> to see the anything ugly. Let's talk about uh, budget for a moment. Um, Susan, what do clients need to know about budgeting for a venue transformation? That's very good. Um, I mean, when it, when it gets to the creative element of transforming a space, it can be done very simplicit, simplicit, simplistic, simplistic. Simply? Yes, that works. <laughs> or, or can be very grand. I mean, so to me, I was like play off the cues of how much drama wants to be made in that statement because... It can be beautiful and very simple, or it can be way over the top. So I kind of, I, my gauge of venue transformation really comes from the planner on the floor, or some planner, and saying, kind of, this is some budget direction, and we often layer it where this is an option, this is an option, and then Lori presents it. Is there any uh, typical, like, hidden costs that people should be aware of? <laughs> you want to take that one? <laughs> well, I mean, since COVID, it's just... Um, the delays and the costs and everything coming in is so much from trucking to staffing. I mean, it's just wood. Like there was a year where, like last year, where the wood price went up overnight 
And they had already quoted flooring and things like that. And it was like, it doubled. Yeah. And that was out of our control. I mean, and then there were even one time where we were expecting a shipment in of something and it didn't get here in time. So we had to go to plan B. So that was an, a, a varied expense that was outside of our control. And a lot of times, if that does happen, which doesn't happen a lot, it, it, it's explainable. There is a reason. And most of the clients are embracing of that change. Before we go to questions, are there any um, major points you know, that maybe I've missed in terms of tips and advice that you would give to planners about venue transformation? I mean, each of you, is there anything? Have fun with it. It's a it's, it's creative process. And there are creative people and then logistical people. So find your, find your buddy out there and then have fun exploring that process together. Lori, Sarah, is there anything else perhaps? I mean, it can be and often is the biggest part of the budget, depending on how big it is. Um, you know, covering up a wall or transforming that bar like we did or the backdrop isn't crazy expensive. But when you're talking about a big event or putting in tenting with flooring, you know, the amount of money that it costs, you know, it kind of starts at like $300,000, which is huge to do a big transformation. So I just say, even if you can't afford now, like I know one of the attendees is really excited to try to introduce pathways and for the ceremony and aisles that are wood and, and platforms for the bride and groom that actually look aesthetically pleasing and go with the venue and the wedding and the flowers. So even things like that can really um, boost the, the care and the look and the custom feeling of your wedding and make it better than typical. So even starting small and hopefully just building your portfolio and getting more clients that might have a vision, but you need to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And... I think it's so fun. It's the part of it that gets me so excited is doing something that no one else has done and something that I kind of imagine. And then Susan makes it better and Sarah comes in and f with her magic fairy dust and like, it just, it's like, it makes me cry. Yeah. <laughs> Happy tears. And, and Sarah, is there, what, what do you, is there anything else maybe that I left out that you'd like to bring up? Yeah, I think it's important to be conscious of when you are making a transformation or maybe when you're covering something that's unslightly, how that money's being spent. Sometimes I feel like, you know, maybe I'm in the second meeting and I want everyone to step back. They want to cover this wall and maybe pipe and drape doesn't look great um, is, is the cheapest, but then they're going to also ask me to put florals in front of it, which is maybe a few, you know, it's, it's some thousands of dollars. And then maybe they should have just built a nice wall to cover it because the florals you might still see through, or maybe, you know, it's like, sometimes I think we get carried away, um, trying to cover something. And then we need to think like, well, actually we're spending this amount of, amount of money. Maybe we should have Susan build a really nice custom wall instead of trying to cover it with fabric and then some potted plants or, you know, whatever. So I think, um, Sometimes it's important to price those out and then think about like, what do we actually want versus where you end up in discussions <laughs> sometimes. And True. I think it's like a lot of, a lot of, well, we always, we talk about the design, you know, many times and we talk through it, um, think about it from all the different perspectives before you choose how you're going to do it. And, and we're in 2022 and like the amount of people that are supporting this industry and creative people that are available to come in and do amazing draping. Susan just happens to be this kind of anomaly in terms of attending and production company where she does fabrication and also incredible tenting and also rentals. But you can find people that can, can help and there's resources now to build cool walls that, and you can find them now. When I started, like, you couldn't find anyone. Like, you look in the yellow pages. I'm not kidding. So, you know, have fun with it and research and find the best way of doing it. And Sarah's really good at finding really cool artisans to help. I remember we did this one wedding um, at, in this big barn, and we wanted something really dramatic. And it was a November wedding, and it was dark and moody. And she found this welder to make this, like, how big was that candle chandelier like 
Oh, I think it was 20 feet. It had two layers, like 15 and 20 feet. 15 and 20 feet, and it had, like, votive candles, and it was, like, a couple rings because the barn is massive, and it was so yeah, beautiful. Yeah, so fun. So, like, there are a lot of people to support you. Know, we, we worked with this welder dude and um, Steve or somebody in um, Allen or Jackson Hole. Anyway, he helped us, <laughs> and that's what kind of makes it fun is in, along the way working with artisans and building – something that has never been done before. Yeah, and what I would say is was when you find that new person, have them send um, photo updates as they're creating. I do this to the day with Lori. I, when we're fabricating it, something in the, our back warehouse, I'll go back, check in on the guys. If I like it, okay, great. Lori, do you like it? And so that's a way to have her vision, initially the goal, get on track versus having the whole thing made and going, eh, I really wanted to change that. So it's like, you can start that with a new person. We did it with the guy in Wyoming as he was making the, the uh, metal arbor. It's yeah. like, give us, you know, photo updates. So you can do it. Why is Zola the fastest growing wedding platform? Because Zola does things differently. They've created a subscription-free platform that works for wedding professionals with free listings tailored to what you do that makes your business look great. And there are no paid placements or stacked search results. They are all validated leads. Zola will match you with pre-qualified couples who they know are a good fit for your style and fee structure. If you want to connect, it's easy. And there are no annual fees or commitment. Just pay for the leads you are interested in at a price that's fair. You're in control. Then there's Zola's excellent customer support, ready to answer any question and help in any way. They'll even create your free listing for you. So grow your business with the wedding platform that's proud to do things differently. Go to Zola.com forward slash Andy. That's Z-O-L-A dot com forward slash Andy to start your free listing and even make your first connections for free. So now is an opportunity. I mean, talk about an opportunity with these three people on the panel to ask anything you want. And we have a, a, a fair amount of time here. So, um, and if you could be as concise as you can, because my memory is so terrible, and re- because I need to repeat the questions back on the microphone. Um, but now's a great chance to ask some questions. So who wants to go first? Yes. Um, questions for Sarah. Um, in terms of, I'm just going to use in particular when you're collaborating with Lori, um, and you've talked about the vision and sort of the treatment and where things are going to be placed, do you provide renderings that you present to Lori and then that is presented to the client? Or is it more of a prototype in person where they'll show maybe just one sort of visual in in sort of the two of you take it behind the scenes from there? Yeah. So when I work with Lori, I mean, Lori's very involved with design and she has a design manager. So I feel like a lot of like the overall concepts Lori's developed from her teams and they do some renderings or drawings and also like Susan's will too if we're building something. Um, For floral concepts, um, my drawings are not as nice as my flowers. <laughs> I make little scribbles. Um, but I do have someone that will do renderings for me when I need it. Um, and that's just usually it depends on who I'm working with and how big of a concept we're talking about. Um, and if we need, you know, to, f- to flesh it out or if we want to see it a few different ways. The one, one thing I'd like to add to that, though, because not with Lori, but with some other planners where they'll do the creative process, design process, do a beautiful rendering of the side of the tent outside or inside and the scale is so wrong and so I I look at it after they've presented it to the client and I'm going that's not really what it's going to look like oh but it's just visual inspiration and the client thought that's what they were going to get so again balance the creative with the practicality and what is going to be shown because it needs to be collaborative that wasn't Lori it was somebody else but (laughs) um, it's very important otherwise you got to manage the clients and clients expect expectations clearly yeah not to scare you guys but part of the reason I started this master class is to kind of inspire you and try to help you to know what you guys need to be knowledgeable on and hopefully develop some sort of expertise on and knowing those things like I don't think that person would do it again no and they it, they didn't it was not intentional at all. It was just no. more of a creative process. And I'm like, I'm the practical one. It doesn't, you know, it's kind of make- <laughs> Right. Yeah. And then in terms of Sarah, like her proposals for the client, she's super efficient and 
quick um, in terms of creative partners um, in talking through when we give her direction and then she comes up with a proposal pretty quickly, which is always appreciated and not always the case. Um, And then we look through it. Everything comes to us. We see if there's any issues or anything left out or something like that. And then she has little images of the individual blooms that she's feeling like would be part of the color story and the floral story at the at the event, knowing the time of year, knowing the venue, knowing all of the inspiration. And yeah, even though it doesn't a lot of times have renderings, we've we've done renderings together, mm-hmm. but and then we do design meetings where we present all of the some centerpieces and a lot of the rental options and we come up with our like two favorites to present to the client. And in the back office, we have a lot of other options in case they say, I really hate that knife. Like it's way too fat or it's way too skinny. I need something else. Or I was imagining not brush gold, but anyway, whatever it is, we want to have this be a collaborative fun thing. Most of the time people come in and they love them, but some people are you know, a little more indecisive, and it's a process, yeah. but... Sometimes it, we do a second or a third mock-up. Yeah. <laughs> and I, the mock-up process or the sample meeting, whatever you call it, um, is, it's hard. I mean, it's because usually it's out of season, or, you know, we try and do it as close to season as possible, and flowers change all the time. So sometimes the mock-up will look a little bit different if we're doing it in a different season. But I really do enjoy being able to hash out, you know, all of that together with different, you know, maybe it's a slightly different yellow or different candle holder. And then we know, and then everyone knows going into it, what, what to expect. Um, and it makes my flower ordering process easier too. I feel like it's more efficient when I do it that way. And then sometimes with larger installations, we'll do a sample mock-up of that as well, like a prototype. Um, and that's great. So we can figure out the structure and, you know, quantities as well. Yes. Lori, can you talk a little bit about what your um, direction looks like when you're providing it to Sarah? Is it is it visual? Is it is it words? Um, is it a diagram, a sketch? Like, how do you get what's in your head to Sarah to start the conversation? I mean, ideally, we would have been to the space together, or she would have been to the space at some point, so that we can because we need a venue before we get to these conversations. So. Um, we present our mood board that had been approved by the client, usually early on in the process, which has palette and feeling and mood. We set up a Zoom with her um, and talk to her a little bit about the client. Um, we show her the save the date, the website, so she gets that feeling. We talk about the venue. We talk about the bridal party. We talk about kind of the flow of the event. If sometimes I have a set flow that I feel very strongly about and other times I'm open and I want to be collaborative because I think the greatest thing that I've learned from this business is, you know, you're so much stronger as a power of three or five or than you are as just one person. So like Sarah as input on color and tone and palettes. Susan obviously has the the logistics and the reality of what I'm asking for and what can happen. And she almost honestly rarely says no, um, which I love. So it's a process, but we kind of get into that. If she can meet with the client, um, that's obviously helpful. Sometimes we do a Zoom to talk, but we would have already kind of fleshed out some of the likes and dislikes of our client from our client by then. And we have a color palette and a kind of vision. And then we layer in Sarah, but usually when I call her to hold the wedding date and she knows I kind of get her excited and I tell her this and this and this. And so, you know, it's, it kind of ruminates in all of our brains too, because sometimes it takes a minute for the light bulb to really go off. And if I could jump in, for the things that, that we build for Lori, a lot of that is just articulated from Lori's, um, the, her vision. And then we go back and we do um, 3D renderings. Like the, the six we back-to-back jobs we did in the yeah. prior years, like everyone was so accustomed in order for me to make sure I was 
hearing correctly what it was and the scale, we would do different renderings and then share them back with her. Yes? Susan, placement for these structures. When, when you're going out and you're looking at a property and you're about to transform it, placement is so critically important. How do the both of you collaboratively determine best placement? When I go, I always look at my biggest, what is the biggest footprint? Um, because there can be so many things that can change. I want to know, especially if I have to travel, you know, two hours to get somewhere, I want to know what's my footprint for what I have to work with. And then from there, that's my template. And then we look at focal points and the guest flow. And uh, for me, that I then can take my space assessment of how much space I need and can make it, you know, 50 feet, 60 feet, and then the length to net out the amount of space. So, so it's overall footprint, and then focal point for when guests walk in is my process to envision what Lori wants. And then she flags it. We talk about it. And um, it's guest flow. It's, it's vendor access. There's a lot of things like where can the trucks pull in that won't disturb the scenery? Where can, how are the guests going to arrive and how they're going to get there and what they're going to see. Yeah. So, but she always flags everything and we go back and forth and, um, like we did in Jackson Hole where there was this open field and we mapped it out. But for some reason, like had having worked in that one field many times, when I was walking with Sarah alone early in the process, I, I just had this idea that just came to me in terms of how to make it work. And Sarah's like, yeah, I love that idea. So it sometimes is easier than others. And sometimes there's a lot more restrictions and like you don't really have a lot of ways to reshape it that will really work with all of the important parts. I know like the technical part of custom builds and production, like it's something I'm so unfamiliar with. And I wanted to know when I go back home and I go to somebody and say like, can you build this for me? Can you make this for me? Also, like, it's such a male-dominated, I feel like, feel so first to see that you're doing it is, like, so amazing and refreshing, and I love that. But I want to be able to be, like, fully informed when I go to, let's say, like, a male vendor, and they're not like, who's this wedding planner? She doesn't know what she's talking about. Are there any resources that I can use so that I know more about, like, the technical aspect of whatever it is that I'm, like, trying to build or create? Yeah. Well, it's a great question. And I, I was thinking back, because like when I started this, whatever, doing this a long time ago, I mean, I didn't have a roadmap. And so I did it by uh, baby steps and um, the little prototypes of working with my guys in the field. So if you don't have those guys in the warehouse to work with, then explain the goal, like show, t take some of the visuals that will um, be shown in the next part of the presentation um, and then get an inspiration, get a, a direction, and then find someone that wants to just collaborate with you and do those prototypes. Because everything, the, the things, that, the fun part with working with Lori is that everything she does is like a different thing every day and a new event, but we always have the foundation of that practice and doing those prototypes because we want to work out those kinks and you've got to start somewhere. And so each of you can roll back the clock like I was 30 years ago and take the energy, take that excitement, go to your peeps back at home and say, hey, I just got this masterclass and I want to create this in our community. Are you going to be on with me and do it? And you've, you'll find people because it's really a fun process. Kristen, you had a question? Oh, yeah. So uh, my question is, when you go into a space, I know that, especially for tenting and for some of these structures that you build, the grading of the ground is super important, like just to make sure that you've got a stable space to put things. What is your approach when it's um, an established venue, not a field where you could potentially modify what you might need in order to do that structure? How do you work with the venue to establish some of these structures that maybe the ground that you want to place it isn't ideal? And or is that just a non sequitur? The best way to do that really is through um, leveling of flooring with jacks. I mean, we use jacks or scaffolding, um, and you, then you create that foundation. And some of the properties are, I mean, we work out are very historic 
and you know you have to explain to them the breath the grass can still breathe and they, there's a certain limitation maybe for how long you can be on the grass so that then um, impacts the level of um, difficulty of what the structure is going to be on top but a lot of it at the venue is just education and and referencing the other properties either locally or you know using my examples of the Bay Area, how we've been able to share with venues that care can be done to protect the grass in order to create a level surface for then you to start your venue transformation on. Does that also include like the pergolas that you do, the structures that you build? How do you, what, what's the footprint like there? With that, the legs can be shimmed. You can put different, and then you can still clad it so it looks continuous. Um, or they can be a custom build to adjust it. But very rarely do those pavilions, um, most of the time they, they are on flat level, and it's not that much of a gradation that you have to deal with it, that shimming cannot, uh, can, can solve it. Can I um, add something to that? So one of the things when you're at a non-level site to create, I like laser level, they call it laser level flooring instead of flooring that kind of hugs the ground, which is quicker to install, but also not ideal when you're dealing with an event and you don't like tables to be on a sloped ground. So if we have laser level, you got to look at the gradation and a, a skilled tenting fabrication flooring company will come out with a laser level and see the gradation. And then you're going to have to be faced with steps and potential railing if, if it's high because it's dangerous. So Usually part of the, and hopefully it's the entrance, but it varies where you have to come in and then work with railing or flooring. And then that usually doesn't look that great. And you don't want the guests to be seeing a side of a platform and we finish them, but they're not like the most beautiful. We try things. to make them look pretty, but yeah. it's, it's wood facade. <laughs> yeah. I was going to piggyback onto what you were asking about the pavilions and things. How do you secure it to the ground? Or do they just, like, I'm envisioning, like, a grid system looking down, right? And then the poles come down. How is that secured so that it... Yeah. For the pavilions themselves, because of the, the weight of the wood and the size and the scale, it, unless you're in a super, super, super really windy area... Um, the, <laughs> okay. So then, then what I would do is... is Jackson Hall. Um, yeah, true. So Jackson Hole, we actually bolted the metal frame. We designed it so the foot plate bolted into the subfloor. It could have been staked into the grass. Um, if it's a wood pavilion that's hollow inside, yeah. so I would do a reverse uh, stake or guy rope down into it and slip it over it. So that gives you this. Some, sometimes you might need out guys if it's a really, really you know, 65 mile out wind, but, but then you have a, other wind issues if you're that strong. But, yeah. <laughs> We have time for a couple more. What's the best practice when creating on a private home and not knowing exactly who's going to be there during the install? If someone's run into an issue where we've gone over the whole plan and the person that, you know, we're of course on site, but the person that owns the home wasn't in, as involved in the process as the other family members, like what kind of key questions do you ask to make sure that it's all okay? What I try to do is um, outline my production timeline because I'm always the first in, last out, and um, put the daily scope as to what what is happening those days and where the where the trucks are going to be coming in, where we're going to be putting crew restrooms um, and dumpsters, so that way it's visually on a map. And I give that to the, the point person and with the goal to make sure that they do share it. Very rarely have that has it not been communicated because they understand the importance of making sure that we have a smooth, smooth entrance. I mean, sometimes we show up like we did in Miami and the city decided to um, dig up the driveway. <laughs> and so then you have to, you know, sometimes you can plan as much as you can plan. And then at that point, it's just collective collaboration. And Lori and I were, you know, talking to the city to try to have them fill the hole so we can get my semis in because, you know, sometimes you just have to punt. Yeah. What I've done, and especially when I'm working in private homes, is I'm always there for the, the load-in days. And, you know, if Susan's there, 
I know it's trustworthy, but I'm in and out a lot. Like she's getting approval on the placement of the structure before they start. So when I arrive, I don't go, oh, no, no, that you have to move this whole thing. <laughs> they, they don't want that. So, so I'm there and I just want the, the homeowner to feel like completely secure in the crews that basically I've recommended and hired for their wedding are being managed and that the if there are issues as the planner and as the overall producer of the event I'm there to help facilitate that Susan's crew is amazing but I think if you can afford and it's also educational to be on site and watch what's going on and I catch things as much as I've worked with Susan and her team like I still catch things that if I wasn't there it would have not been ideal Mm -hmm. So being there and then obviously we meet with the grounds person. We make sure we, if we're staking, we need to meet with, I mean, we need to get all of that information. We need power, um, sewer, you know, the housekeeper, if the bathrooms run out of toilet paper. I mean, there's just (laughs) a lot of things. Nikki, you had a question? Oh, I was wondering about permitting. Where are you obtaining this from? And is it always necessary? And, you know, what are the different permits that you can hold? Yeah, so the very good question about, you know, per- permitting. And um, there's every city and county, at least in the Bay Area, uh, is a little bit different. For So technically for... Um, tents of the size for a wedding. Um, if you're on private property, a lot of times it's not, ne- it, well, technically it's needed, but it's private property. And we, we often don't do it because it's not needed. But when you go through the process, we make sure that all the materials in the tent are IFR. So that way we do, we proceed with the plan as if it were um, to be permitted. If it, if, I say not, I mean, most weddings are on private property, but sometimes when you're at like Filoli, then we do all the, the permits and they come out with the building and the city and the fire and they do the inspection. So it really have to know your zones and then in terms of um, where you do need the permit and where you don't need a permit for tenting. Some cities in, like, as at Atherton, that you need other event permits and sound permits and things like that. But that, I don't do that. The planner does. Yeah. And, and fire is the biggest thing. Safety. Yeah. Any other questions? I have a question. Katie? This is for Susan and also for Lori. So a rental order for a venue transformation is often written in a language that could be foreign to a planner who's dealing with it for the first time. Um, How much of a review do you expect the planner to do when they're looking at things like wood measurements or draping panels? Do you take ownership of making sure that those different details are correct, or do you expect the planner to be able to translate that language to verify it for you before the rental order is signed off on? We, as the rental tenting company, um, we have our own terminology and wording that we internally use with our, you know, our company, and even between tent companies, we all use different verbiage. So how do we, do we expect a planner to fully read that, fully understand that? And quite honestly, no. On the order. On the order, yeah. yeah. We, we have the, the verbal conversation, and then sometimes I'll do like a summary, like this is what's included in this, a paragraph. So that way, you got, planners are busy. We're all busy. It's like this is, this is what we're, we're providing in terms of the scope of services. The contract is our work order that then allows me to fabricate load the trucks and get out there. So I don't expect them to read it because it's many, many pages because there's many, many, many details that then are captured in that, that paragraph or that summary. Good question. We have time for one more. Yes. So for attending and you just brought up like safety issues, which are extremely important to guests and, and vendors and everybody, but how do you go about sticking with fire code and making sure exits are safe and all of those things that are, might be unsightly to try to cover, I guess that can be for Sarah too. How do we cover it and make things pleasing and sightly for, and still make sure things are safe? Yeah. So the, the question I'm hearing is how do we collaborate to balance safety with aesthetics in the environment? It's very, very important and it's very, very critical to do it right because, you know, 
I always know how many exits I need to have for an occupancy. I can't cheat that. That and so it's really a matter of where those exits go with sight lines and then focal points. Um, and making sure egress is on the outside of the tent. You're not going to walk right into a fence then. So, so that when you were laying it out, that's the space assessment analytical part that we then make those exits look pretty. We make sure that the doors are not the typical aluminum tent doors. We make them pretty wood doors and we paint them or stain them. Um, so that way you have a functional exit, but it doesn't have to be traditional rental inventory. And then Lori has, you know, exit signs are, you want to speak to your beautiful exit signs? <laughs> yeah, we'll use them tonight so you can look for them. But usually for fire code, they have um, green or red illuminated, which is required now, exit signs. And they're always the same size. So I had, I don't know, eight years ago, one of our fabricator graphic partners make these plexiglass gray exit signs that kind of mimicked the dark gray that mimicked the exit sign with the word exit, but exit was done in either a matte silver or a matte gold. And we put it on top of the sign with command strips. And it, we even did it last night in the restaurant. Um, and it just, it's still there and it still does it. And occasionally you get kicked back from a crazy venue about it. But a lot of venues are excited because it makes the photographs look much prettier and it's still functioning. And you can even have the, the lighting company, because it isn't as illuminated, light it with one of their pin spots or something if, if they're being weird about it. And I think fire is probably the thing, the fire codes and things with candles is something that we're always thinking about. Um, I always like to use like wispy grasses in my centerpieces, but those don't mix well with votives <laughs> <laughs> because the grass will move in the wind or whatever and um, can catch fire. So just making sure candles are covered if we're using arrangements that could move. And then also, I mean, sometimes you know, a guest will move a centerpiece like straight into a candle or something. I don't notice. And that's something I can't really avoid, but we're always being really thoughtful of um, that process and also putting lanterns on staircases or dark paths, um, you know, that people might be when they're leaving the event and they're not all together anymore, <laughs> you know, make sure they've got that path illuminated. And doing a lighting check with your lighting company the night before. So you can go through and walk through the guest and the vendor experience so that not only is the dining area and the dance area really beautiful, but also that your paths or your exits are also safe. Great. And if we could go one by one and let everyone know how to find you, website and social media handles. Susan, if you could start. Uh, yeah, Susan Kidwell, Hensley Event Resources, Hensley, Hensley Event Resources com. And your Instagram? My Instagram. Josie? Hensley. Hensley. <laughs> I'm not the social media, but I'm so sorry. Sounds Hensley like me. at Hensley at Hensley Event Resources. Um, Lori at LoriAarons dot com. L a u r i e a r o n s. Instagram is just at Lori Aarons. And website and social media. Sarah? Website LoriAarons dot com. SarahWinward dot com is my website, and social media is at Sarah underscore Winward. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. This has been very informative. Thank you all for listening and take care. Thanks.